I'm happy to be again with you here uh, in the series on theories of regulation. And today with us, uh, Professor Jody Short. Uh, and because we are late, I will uh, just ask her um, to present her, her uh, paper or, or presentation on the paranoid style of uh, regulation uh, or, or regulatory policy, actually. So Jody, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. OK, so. Um... I guess I want to start by uh, coming clean about my own paranoia before I start analyzing uh, others that I see circulating in our discipline. So I fear that we employ logics in our work that undermine the project we purport to be pursuing, which is to say effective, fair, equitable regulation. I see a fundamental ambivalence in regulatory scholarship uh, between capable government and coercive government and an anxiety about the trade-off between the two. And I fear that we often misrecognize state capacity and efficacy as state coercion, or that at the very least, we unwittingly contribute to processes of misrecognition that foreground certain elements of coercive state power while they submerge actual exercises of state violence. So I admit to employing a paranoid style even as I critique it. I borrow the term from Richard Hofstetter's essay, The Paranoid Style in American Politics uh, from a 1964 Harper's article. And, and I do want to give the caveat that this is that I am telling very much an American story, so I will be interested um, to hear how it resonates in different parts of the world. Um, but Hofstetter uses the term paranoid style to describe a mode of argumentation that evokes exaggeration, suspiciousness, and conspiratorial fantasy. Uh, those are his words. And he argues that this style is endemic to American political discourse. Note that this has to do with style, not substance. Style has more to do with the way in which ideas are believed than with the truth or falsity of their content, he says. So Hofstetter was interested in getting at our political psychology through our political rhetoric. And what I've been interested in for quite a while now is getting at our regulatory scholars, uh, psychology, if you will, through our regulatory rhetoric. A different way of putting this that is, um, hang on just a second, I think I need to share. Okay. Uh, a different way of getting at this that, you know, I think is maybe a little more in line with the way that we typically talk about these things in our discipline um, is in, in the language of uh, regulatory logics, right? So Robert Baldwin and Julia Black have argued that our rhetoric about regulation constructs regulatory logics that embody a set of understandings, assumptions, and predictions about how regulators and regulated entities behave, how they interact with regulatory institutions, and how they will respond to certain regulatory interventions. Regulatory logics shape how policymakers and citizens think about regulation and imagine its possibilities and its limitations. And so, Put in these terms, my concern is that our regulatory rhetoric often constructs regulatory logics that are antithetical to effective regulation. I stake out this position in an article called The Paranoid Style in Regulatory Reform. In that article, I take on the conventional account of how the late 20th century regulatory reform movement shifted regulatory logics. So, the conventional account of regulatory reform is that it shifted the logic of regulation from certain old logics like justice, fairness, precaution, public interest, to a different logic, the economic logic of efficiency and welfare maximization. What I show in that article is that efficient, efficiency logic is not the only logic underlying regulatory reform. In fact, paranoia and state uh, paranoia about state coercion and tyranny is a driving logic as well. Now, 
The father of the paranoid style in regulatory rhetoric and regulatory reform is Hayek, who saw even isolated instances of state regulatory power as a step down the slippery slope to fascism. Each degree of restraint imposed by the state multiplies the danger of taking a next restrictive step, he says. Freedom is not divisible. Regulation is not a system which can be coolly experimented with and then dropped if it fails with no greater loss than a return to the status quo. There is no easy way back. These kinds of arguments deeply influenced Chicago school economists like Henry Simons, Milton Friedman, and um, the one you see here, George Stigler, who fretted, if the expansion of control of economic life, which has been underway in Britain, the United States, and other democratic Western countries should continue long enough and far enough, the totalitarian system of Nazi Germany and fascist Italy will eventually be reached. Now, what has always puzzled me is the relish with which lawyers took up these arguments. These are economists, right? Um, and the, you know, there's obviously a lot of interchange between the two disciplines, but as a sociologist who has spent a lot of time studying institutions, who has read a lot about professions, um, you know, it puzzles me, you typically don't let another discipline just come in and, and storm your turf like that, right? Lawyers would seem to have their own set of disciplinary commitments and tools to construct a very different vision of the regulatory state, but by and large, they don't do so. Many become seduced by the efficiency logic, but many also sign on to this kind of coercive state paranoia. And what they do is they take traditional rules-based regulation and turn it into a straw man that they name command and control regulation. And then they proceed to describe command and control regulation in terms that highlight its coercive nature, right? So these are quotes pulled from law review articles where legal scholars are talking about regulation as being a wholly coercive instrument that tells regulated entities exactly what to do and how to do it achieves its objectives through brute force. You have some that are even drawing direct links to fascism, for instance, characterizing environmental regulators as the manure Gestapo, or um, one who opines that having the EPA determine the proper allocation, sorry, the proper pollution control mechanisms for a steel mill in Pittsburgh, a sugar refinery in Hawaii, or a power plant in Mendocino, is akin to having the Supreme Soviet determine how much cotton farmer Tolstoy should plant in Uzbekistan. Now, what I argue in the paper is that this goes beyond just rank silliness, and it has real consequences. As arguments accumulate in the legal literature about the coercive nature of regulation, um, and as these kinds of arguments start to swamp arguments based on logics of cost and efficiency, this is accompanied by a change in the recommended regulatory reforms. Specifically, it is accompanied by an increasing preference for self-regulatory solutions. Why? Well, what the articles themselves say is because these solutions best preserve the freedom of regulated entities and individuals. My read of that is because they best respond to the regulatory logic of state coercion. Now, the analysis in this paper ended in 2005, but the rhetoric about regulation has only become more shrill in intervening years. Lately, that rhetoric has focused on the burdens of regulation, right? And it's, it's rife with metaphor. So, um, you know, you see think tanks that talk about regulation as a thicket. You know, you can't even see through it, much less walk through it. Um, there are, there's a lot of imagery of, um, of, of magnitude and of weight, right? Regulation is something that weighs you down, that saps the strength and freedom of business owners, like literally crushing them with its weight, right? The, the visual metaphors, the verbal metaphors 
have become very much about this weight, the weight of this burden. And um, this is where regulation counting comes into the picture. Regulation counting projects purport to measure the size and the weight of the regulatory burden. There are many different ways of doing this, right? Many different um, methodologies employed. For instance, counting the number of pages in the Federal Register or the Code of Federal Regulations or whatever regulatory code that um, you're interested in. Um, the, the methodology that's currently being held out as state of the art is called reg data, which counts the number of restrictions or requirements in the CFR, or again, whatever regulatory corpus you apply its search terms to. Essentially, it's an algorithm that searches for words like shall, must, may not, prohibited, and required. And it tallies them up and gives you a, a measure, it says, of the amount of regulatory burden in total and on specific industries. Um, this is not just an idle pursuit. It is being put to many uses. It is sold to government officials as, quote, a research platform that allows users to quickly analyze state regulations and identify the specific industries most targeted by excessive regulation and it has actually been used by state officials for just such purposes. It has been used to support two for one policies that require the, appeal, the repeal of two regulations, sometimes more depending on the jurisdiction, um, in order to uh, propose any new one. And it is also marketed to academics who are encouraged to use regulation count data to identify causal relationships between regulation counts and various outcome variables of interest, uh, often macroeconomic outcomes like employment and productivity. A recent research article asked, how many regulations does it take to get a beer? And proceeded to count 10,212 for the average state in the United States. Now, one reaction to this might be, well, if you can count that high, maybe you're not drinking enough beer. But while this might seem like harmless fun, the problem is that this type of scholarship legitimizes regulation counts as measures. And my view is that from the standpoint of social science methodology, there are many empirical problems with regulation counts that make them unsuitable as measures, at least of what they purport to be measuring, which is to say regulatory burden. So I detailed this argument in a paper called The Trouble with Counting. I'll just give you a brief summary here of the, the outline of the critique, right? So, um, so I demonstrate that these counts do not account for the weight of regulations. They do not account for the scope of coverage of regulations. They do not account for the object of regulation. In other words, who is restricted by the regulation, right? So, so many of these mandatory terms actually restrict the government from doing things to private parties rather than private parties from doing what they wish to do. But those regulations are counted as burdens on private uh, entities. They do not account for structural relationships among regulations. For instance, mandatory terms that might limit the scope of other regulations in the form of exceptions, for instance. Uh, they ignore basic grammatical conventions. The, for instance, the fact that some mandatory terms appear in questions rather than statements. And the fact that some are neg negated by adverbs like no or not. For instance, you are not required. That is counted as a burden. Um, they do not, moving beyond the text of the regulations, they do not account for rampant non-enforcement of regulations on the books. They treat conditional benefits as burdens. For instance, mineral leases, um, things, goodies that the government is giving away uh, based on certain conditions. Those are counted as burdens on regulated entities. And indeed, there is absolutely no accounting for benefits in regulation counting. The construct 
um, that counts purport to measure is regulatory burden. Regulation counters have abandoned altogether the pretense of cost-benefit analysis that regulation should be welfare maximizing, taking into account both their costs and benefits. And instead, they put everything on the cost side of the scale, even many benefits. That is not social science. That is not economic theory. It is ideology, pure and simple. And we, as researchers, must be very careful about how we use these instruments. Now, if it can be allowed that regulation counts measure anything, and they might, right? I mean, we, we count lots of things, but the thing we need to be careful about is the construct we place on them. So, um, so, so I, I could grant that maybe these counts are measuring something, but I suspect that what they measure is people's unquantifiable feelings about regulation rather than any actual concrete specific costs that are imposed by regulations. Now, I don't say this to be dismissive, right? I, I believe that feelings about regulation are important. And in fact, we've tried to quantify them um, for years in cost benefit analysis, right? I'm thinking about uh, analyses that try to capture existence value, for instance, right? So, so people have a wide range of feelings about regulation from distressed about the perceived burdens it imposes on small business owners, for instance, to the despair that a lack of regulation might strand the last polar bear on earth on a runaway ice floe. Feelings about regulation are important and I believe that we should surface them, but I think that we might get further in debates about regulation if we stop trying to quantify these feelings and recognize them for what they are, expressions of deeply held values that must be engaged forthrightly in political discourse. Now, I wanna pick up this thread of recognition and conclude with some remarks on the importance of recognition and misrecognition in the field of regulation and governance. Our regulatory rhetoric, conflating fact with feeling, e equating regulation with state tyranny, actively promotes misrecognition of state power. And I'm using that term in Bourdieu's sense. Um, he says that misrecognition occurs when existing objective arrangements come to be seen as something other than what they really are. It renders reality beyond the realm of thought, allowing existing power relations to be seen as natural and inevitable. Misrecognition of fact and feeling in the regulatory domain inhibits us from using regulation effectively to address the most pressing crises, crises confronting us. Rising global temperatures, melting the ice around that bear are a quantifiable fact. The COVID-19 pandemic and the ones that follow it quantifiable facts. To address crises like this will require many stacks of regulation. To be sure, people might have feelings about those stacks of regulation and those stacks of regulation might present their own sets of problems, but we must recognize the stark difference between these different types of problems. Similarly, characterizing the stacks of regulation as state coercion works a different and equally dangerous type of misrecognition by deflecting attention from systematic uses of state violence and from the way that these are facilitated by regulation. Granted, it might be fruitful to take seriously people's negative feelings about how things like uh, business regulations and mask regulations affect their feelings of being free. But it is utterly imperative to recognize that these feelings cannot in any way be equated with the fact of systematic state violence that marks the bodies and restricts the physical and economic freedom of Black, 
brown, native, poor, colonized, and other marginalized populations. It is imperative to recognize also how regulation has supported and continues to support that violence and also how it can be used as a tool to address it. As regulatory scholars, I believe that we have an important role to play in promoting recognition and resisting misrecognition of state power in the regulatory sphere. We are in a position to see things for what they really are. We have a responsibility to consider how our rhetoric about regulation can either promote recognition or contribute to processes of misrecognition. I hope that my reflections today provoke you to take up that challenge in your own work. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Jody. It's a fascinating um, presentation and uh, um, an impressive uh, argument uh, with depths and uh, scopes that uh, I rarely see. So thank you very much. And I hope uh, I'm opening, op opening the, the, the floor for questions and remark. Who wants to go first? Uh, I see Tony raising his hand. So Tony, please. Right, uh, right, just unmuted. Um, thank you very much. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and um, it, it, I think it's basically right. <laughs> I do agree with you. You asked for a comparative national experience, and I'm just thinking about it from the viewpoint of the UK. And I think the narrative may be a bit different here, um, because I think rather than being broad brush anti-regulation, it's concentrated in either in particular areas of regulation or in particular sources of regulation. Um, good example would be health and safety regulation, um, which has fallen victim to a lot of press caricatures of stupid bans, uh, which are doing things which should not be true. Uh, about 10 years ago, I interviewed a health and safety executive official who was about to retire. And he was saying that when he started off, he was a factory inspector and he'd go to pubs people would buy him pints of beer, saying you're doing something really important, protecting us. Um, at the end of his career, he was always dismissed in the pub as someone who banned people playing games they wanted to play, things like that. Um, so I think it's that subject matter, firstly. Secondly, origin. Um, again, in the UK, the narrative has been very strong that the EU imposed regulations that were undemocratic because it was claimed it, they were made by an unaccountable bureaucracy um, and were absurd. So I think that was the other strong element of the narrative. By contrast, I think health regulation has not attracted that sort of narrative here, um, partly because um, the NHS is so dominant and is so largely trusted. Um, it's also been apparent in relation to vaccines. Um, that there the concern has not been over-regulation, it's been under-regulation. Um, have the vaccines been rushed through too quickly without proper scrutiny and consideration of side effects? So while I accept everything you said, um, I think I would go for a bit more breakdown from area and source to area and source, rather than constructing it as a narrative which covers all types of regulation. Yeah. Thanks for that perspective. I think that's really fair. Um, and I mean that you see that in the US as well. Um, I guess I, I would, um, I mean, the, the way that I see it breaking down in the US actually ties into my fears about misrecognition, right? Because where you see um, an embrace of regulation has been in areas like immigration, um, incarceration, criminal law, right? Those, those types of areas, um, uh, we, we seem to have no, um, no reticence, right? About, uh, about promulgating reams of, uh, of rules and, and applying them quite punitively to people. Um, so, uh, so, so you're absolutely right. It's important to think about those nuances. Thank you. Um, more questions, uh, comments? Uh, if not, uh, I will go first. 
Um, so thank you very much, uh, Jody, again. Um, I'm involved, as you probably know, in a counting uh, exercise myself. Uh, without, um, the, the aim is not um, uh, ideological, um, at least not in, for sure, not in the right, uh, from the right uh, wing uh, direction and so on. And um, so it was um, useful to hear your um, uh, kind of warning signals, but what I see more generally in the, all over the world, and this is also via the counting exercise, is that we have more and more, more and more regulation. Yeah, uh, regulation is expanding. Even the Trump administration with his crazy agenda uh, didn't uh, radically uh, change the, the direction of uh, history. So my, 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 I'm saying, okay, there is a paranoid style in America um, and um, it has influence all over the world, including my own country, Israel. Uh, and of course you see it also in Europe. Um, um, and, and actually the, the, the cost benefit uh, movement uh, largely originated from there or somewhat originated from there, but the, the reality is stronger than, than those feelings. And, and we have a, after four dec decades of, uh, of paranoid uh, style or, or ideological attacks, uh, regulation is going, is, is, a, is, is, is booming is a booming in the industry. So in this sense, um, I, ask, I want to ask you in, in, in what respect you really deal with the, the, the reality of uh, continuing regulation on the one end and to what extent the paranoid style is really um, relevant um, in, in, in explaining what's going on. Well, so, so I think it's always been a challenge for me to, to reconcile these views with the comparative politics literature. I know that there are lots of regulation counters out there that are operating in a different political and academic con uh, context and, and using these measures for different things. So I guess, you know, I, I would say that's, you know, my, my problem with regulation counting really has more to do with the construct that's being placed on the regulation counts in certain quarters rather than the exercise itself. In much of my own quantitative work, I count things. And, and you know, there are always arguments that can be made, some of them spurious against doing that, right? I mean, you need to count things in order to, to, to do certain kinds of quanti uh, quantitative work. And so, so I guess that's what I would say. We need to be really careful about the constructs that we're placing on the counts. Yeah. And I, you know, the, the theory that you have developed using those counts is really in a, it, it's very different, right? Um, I, I guess where it, it is interesting to think about how you reconcile theories of regulatory capitalism with theories of the paranoid style, um, because the paranoid style, you're right, has not been successful in in cutting down the growth of regulation, right? And significantly cutting the amount of regulation, what it purports to do. Um, but I think that it has been quite effective in debilitating certain regulatory programs to address wicked problems like climate, like, uh, you know, I mean, um, like the pandemic, right? I mean, I think that in instances where we really need to regulate, it it has impacts in how we're willing to regulate and the politics around regulation in any given instance. So I think that's where it has real traction. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Jody. Uh, Ruth, uh, do you want to join, please? Thank you, that's great. That was really interesting um, and a, an excellent corrective because I spend a lot of time counting things and it's really good to, to think about what you're counting and whether it's actually counting the opposite and so on. So that was a great presentation. My question really followed um, Tony Prosser's. I'm in the UK as well, and it's to do with the um, source of the regulations in terms of their legitimacy. Um, a lot of the argument um, during 
COVID pandemic was the number of regulations that the government just produced out of the air, as it were, without proper parliamentary scrutiny for secondary legislation and, and guidelines. And, and so the whole thing became a, a big um, continuum between things that were enshrined in law and all the way through to guidelines, which, and so the confusion there wasn't so much that people really disagreed with the regulations, but that they didn't feel that they were um, properly scrutinized. And I wondered if you'd addressed any of that in your studies. Yeah, so I, I think that that's a little bit on a line um, of my categories that I use in the Paranoid Style article. Um, it sounds like you're talking about process objections to regulation. And I would say that that, you know, if the, if the, reg, if the objection truly is about, the, you know, the process wasn't followed, that's not necessarily the paranoid style. But it can bleed into the paranoid style where it becomes an argument about, well, these decisions are just being made by unelected bureaucrats who have no accountability to the people and who are, you know, behaving lawlessly, right? Behaving tyrannically, right? So, so a process argument can very quickly slide into a paranoid style argument. Um, and so I guess you'd have to look at them individually to see what exactly is the substance of the arguments that people are making. Roy and Jonathan after him. Roy, please. Okay, thank you very much, Jody, for the for the presentation. A very very stimulating topic. Uh, I would have a question. Uh, I'm also part of the of the counting group, perhaps here. So uh, this gives a lot a lot of food for thought. And I was wondering if whether some of your reservations on these counting exercises could be addressed by moving from this macro analysis or of, okay, let's try to count regulations all, all over all sectors and moving more to uh, sector specific questions, more narrow defined questions by industry and being a little bit more uh, specific about what are the targets of the regulations, what are the benefits and costs do you, do you think that this would address more, most of the, your methodological concerns that you have presented in one of, the, of your slides? I, not necessarily. I mean, again, I think that it, that it really depends on what is the construct that you place on that measure, right? So, so I guess you can ask lots of different questions at lots of different scales about the burdens of regulation. But if you continue to say, well, what we're measuring when we count regulations in this sector is the burden of regulation, then I still have an issue with that measure if it's the, you know, if it's the same measure that's being used. Um, so I guess it, it, it has more to do with, with understanding more deeply what it is exactly that you're measuring. And I mean, as you say, like trying to... Um, I, I mean, I guess I have a different set of problems with measuring costs and benefits, but, but let's accept that for now. That's not what regulation counters are doing, um, at least not the ones that I'm looking at, right? It's because it's not about measuring costs and benefits. There are no benefits. They don't measure the benefits. Um, they simply measure what they say are the costs and then draw conclusions from there. Yeah, thank you, Jody. Uh, Jonathan? Uh, thank you, David, and thank you, Jody. Um, yeah, my co my comment or question follows on that last point, which is, um, you know, I, I like that you are uh, um, raising a critique to the kinds of counting that you've described here. Um, and I, my reaction is that there's a difference between counting and paranoia, and that you're uh, part of your critique in its strongest is about um, bad counting, is that the counting that's going on, for instance, counting the words required and so forth in the reg data data sets are not an accurate uh, depiction of the even the true burden. And then, as you say, they're, they're not counting the benefits. Um, so that a full benefit cost analysis would be a much richer it would still have limitations which should be recognized, but it would be a much richer depiction of what regulation is really doing. 
than just you know counting the number of times the word required is used or shall. <clears throat> okay, but then the kinds of ideological arguments about coercion or about the creep, the slippery slope of the creep of tyranny, um, those are not uh, connected to counting necessarily. Um, and, not, and certainly not to counting the benefits. So I take your point about those, the Hayekian uh, and, and progeny uh, kinds of critiques as being um, perhaps the ideological predicate for the um, distortion of counting, but not a critique of counting itself. That is, when you talk about climate change and, and uh, state violence, for example, I understood your appeal there to be an appeal for better understanding, for better counting in a sense that we should count the important uh, damages of climate change and, and social damages of, uh, of state violence. <clears throat> so we get a, a, a good depiction of those, an accurate depiction of those in our policymaking. So I guess the, the reaction I'm, posing is that the, um, there's a critique of counting, which needs to be, you know, of, of um, uh, inaccuracies in counting. And then there's a critique of the paranoid style as uh, a, an ideological bent in the, um, in the use of counting. See, what, uh, what, do you, what do you think of that? Yeah, no, that's totally fair. And um, let, let me let me just say that this is actually the first forum in which I've tried to weave together these two distinct projects. So um, so I'm glad you're pressing me on the connection a little bit. But um, but I think and I, and I totally hear what you're saying. I, I mean, I think that those are totally fair criticisms. Um, here's where I see the connection. So I see it first in Reg Data's singling out of mandatory words, right? Um, I mean, they say that this is a refinement in the empirical methodology, right? Like we're trying to be more, um, you know, more targeted than just counting pages. Fair enough, but there's a real valence to that target, right? And that's used politically to sell this, for instance, to state and local governments, right? To the governor of Iowa, here's why you should use red data because we can scrape your regulatory code and tell you the places in which you are coercing regulated industries, like overly excessively burdening them with coercive mandatory regulations, right? So they themselves are, and, and they're, 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 that, that is embedded in their methodology and they're using it in their marketing to government actors, right? So, so they are, it's their way, I mean, no one ever, they, they, these counts of pages of the CFR have been around forever, right? And no one ever did anything with them really. And so the, the, this move to make it actually, to make these counts usable by government actors to take regulations off the books, that's where they start plugging it into these paranoid style types of narratives. Okay, so I guess that's the first piece of it. And then, I think that the, the other move that I'm trying to make is where, is where I'm, trying to, um, I'm trying to come up with a construct that, that might actually be what these counts measure, right? And so, so my argument is that they don't measure the actual cost burden of regulation. What they measure is people's negative feelings about regulation which are quite real, right? And, and maybe they should be quantified, just like we try to quantify in cost-benefit analysis, like the, how much people love polar bears, right? So, um, so, <laughs> uh, so, so I guess that's where, so, but, but if I'm right about that, um, and you, know, you can press me on that, but if I'm right about that, that is very much tied into the paranoid style, right? It's this idea that, that there, are there's a there is a sizable amount of the population that just feels regulation as being coercive as constraining their freedom you know so um so i guess that's where i see the other tie-in and i see that kind of feeling and also you know then the 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 regulatory discourse that 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 I, you know, that I guess is, is validating that kind of feeling 
as being re really debilitating for solving these other kinds of problems. And I mean, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe at the end of the day, what you're saying is right, that what I'm really thinking is that we need to bring uh, better calculation and more costs and benefits into the, so maybe I get to the same place as you, but I guess um, that, that's my route there. Um, so for what it's worth. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. And I see, I, I see no end. So I will uh, just uh, say that uh, the third part of uh, your project is uh, about democratic uh, democracy and regulation, maybe. If I remember right, you wrote something about uh, the democratic uh, democracy and regulation. Um, and this might uh, be a short part of the, of, of the project. Uh, can you first uh, just tell me, am, am I right? Uh, that kind of, what is democracy and what is the, what is the role of regulation in democrat democratic development? And the demand for the democratic demand for regulation on the on the other end, uh, not only the paranoia is part of your analysis, or maybe I'm wrong. Uh, this is not uh, something that you did uh, in the past and didn't bring today here today. So I I have not done a whole lot of thinking about democratic theory and regulation. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess this, this it, it's a similar critique to Jonathan's, um, I guess from a different angle, right? So I think I'm diagnosing some problems that I think are debilitating. Then the question would be, well, what's the, what's the answer, right? Do we need more democratic? Do we, need, do, do we need to democratize regulation? Do we need better calculations? Um, I don't, I don't have good answers to those questions. Um, I mean, yeah. to be honest, I guess I tend to, I tend to resist um, the, uh, the siren song of democratizing regulation and you know more participation. And um, I, I tend to be fine with technocracy. Um, yeah. And I, I think that we need it to solve some of those types of problems. Uh, I mean, I guess maybe that's where I'm going, right? I mean, because ultimately I think that I, I'm comfortable with certain coercive exercises of state power to the extent that we've decided as a collective that some certain problems need to be solved through regulation. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would wanna push us toward a comfort level with that, just an acceptance that that is part of having a state. And, but, you know, but that also recognizing that all, you know, what we might just call coercive exercises of state power, which is, you know, by definition, a state enforcing its laws, right? Um, they're not equal. And some exercises of coercive state power are more violent and more harmful and more damaging than others. So I guess that's really the direction that, that I'm going um, rather than towards some vision of democracy. I see. Um, Marcus wants, uh, wants to, to, to come into the discussion, but before I let Marcus in, I, I'd like to say uh, something uh, along the lines that, uh, while I find the appeal of uh, the Parnid style of regulation, uh, uh, the appeal is, 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 is very strong for me or very big for me and the way I think about regulation. But when we are thinking about um, uh, the, style of, the style of regulation in, in the US, it's always, always um, both the paranoid style, but also a very positive democratic demands for, for regulation, which exists until today on issues of uh, climate, climate change and, and other. So it was never, um, um, it, it was always there, the two, the two sides. So it's the, those conflicting sides um, get another chance now in the area of uh, the new administration, maybe after the post pandemic war and so on. Um, so this is, this is the one. And as someone who, who really uh, published the reg data papers, paper at the time, um, and also the paper on the beers counting, I think they are, they are a good exercise in research. Uh, you know, they, 
I see the deficiencies or the limitations uh, as, as in other papers that we publish, but this is one, one step forward for me and not because the establishing the contra ideological point on contra to mine and yours, uh, obviously. But uh, let uh, Marcus uh, 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 ask. So Marcus, please. Hi, Jody. Um, thank you very much. That was fascinating. Um, I, I, on the subject of different areas of regulation, different uh, targets for regulation, my background is in aviation security, specifically air cargo security. And I've been working with governments in different countries, uh, Europe, America, Canada, Australia, on developing IT systems to implement air cargo regulations. And, and that, my interest was IT, but it got me involved in how and where regulations come from. And I, I really didn't find this issue of them being paranoid about the number of regulations. I found them being paranoid about if they didn't regulate and something went wrong. And something went wrong means a plane blowing up or, or passengers in the plane being, being killed or whatever. However, I really found that all of the regula all of the in all of the attempts to put in place regulations were limited by the cost of actually doing that, what it would mean to put in the kind of regulations that meant that every piece of cargo going on a plane would have to be examined in some way. Um, versus the danger if it wasn't done, what would happen to the people who didn't put the, put the regulations in place? So I, I wondered whether whether you, that any of that the issues of, of different kind of regulatory environments has come into to what you're doing. But I have another question as well. Um, from this work we did in air cargo security, we became involved in actually how does one bring together the right, the right constitution of people into the room in order to develop regulations that are effective, cost-effective and actually work. And I, I failed miserably in that, that the, 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 the governments I was working with were not willing to have the actual companies who put the, the cargo on their aircraft and the customers who bought those goods in the room when discussing what kind of regulation was, was fair and just and effective. And I wondered whether you've had any experience of, of, of how these regulations were, were, were developed in terms of the, the extent to which that paranoia is there. Thanks. Yeah, great. So, um, so I, yeah, I, I, cer I certainly take your point uh, that that different regulatory domains uh, that this is going to manifest very differently in different regulatory domains. And I kind of like your idea of sort of like the uh, of flipping the paranoia, right? So, so I wonder if we could uh, if we could take the uh, American pension for the paranoid style. And turn it towards the problems that that we're facing, rather than towards the regulation meant to solve those problems. Um, it might be an interesting jujitsu type of a rhetorical move. Um, and you know, then in terms of um, just you know, I mean, wh whether this comes up, I I, I don't have um, you know personal experience as a researcher or um, just, you know in my employment history sitting in those rooms and. Um, you know, and seeing what kinds of argument, when people are actually trying to hammer out regulations, to what extent paranoid style arguments are, are leveraged. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a project right now on, uh, on tech regulation and um, tracing the arguments that big tech companies make in response to certain efforts to regulate them and documenting very much these kinds of arguments. That's coming from lobbyists, right? I mean, that's all in public, that's visible. Uh, but it's a, it's a really interesting question what happens when they sit down in a room with regulators, if that's still the kind of conversation that occurs. And I mean, there's one interesting project that I, um, that I heard about at uh, Law and Society Association. There's a woman at Wisconsin doing research on the development of US trade policy and, um, and tech lobbying in that context. And she actually has incredible access, you know, talking to, to trade representatives who are actually making policy and doing negotiations. And there is a little bit of a window into that world. And the arguments being made, um, according to this paper, when the, the tech lobbyists sit down behind closed doors with the trade 
representative are the same, right? Um, we need freedom. We need, um, you know, you can't, you can't, you, what I, it, it's all those kinds of freedom and coercion sorts of arguments. Um, and again, I don't know if that, that's, that's one domain. I don't know if that's true across all domains, but um, that, that's, that's what I know. Thank you, Jody. Um, anyone else? Uh, uh, so, uh, if uh, possible, Jody, do you, do you want to say a few last sentences that will summarize the the argument, uh, or take it uh, beyond what you had? Uh, you were exactly on the time, so the the floor is yours. Oh my goodness, uh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting a postscript. Um, I, I think I'll just leave it there. Uh, I really wanna thank all of you for engaging in conversation on this and, um, and letting me share these ideas that have been um, percolating for a long time. And um, you know, it's, it's interesting to try and connect things up and, um, and, and get, uh, get reactions to that. So I appreciate you all engaging in the, in the project with me. Yeah, so if you don't want to do the postscript, let me ask you one more question before we... Okay. So where are you heading now um, after those uh, two large projects? Um, what is the next one? Well, I mean, there are a lot of things. Um, I guess in on this general theme, probably this regulation uh, or this project on big tech regulation is the closest. Um, trying to trace arguments uh, that that have been made against regulation, and um, and so you know that's just using um, that documents from publicly available sources. Uh, but then the the heart of the project, uh, we've been working with a computer scientist on a topic model that is um, that's scraping data from um, news reports for uh, from the last 10 years from a huge corpus of um, you know of digital um, news media to try and find out whether those arguments um, have gained traction just kind of in public discourse and the interesting thing that we're finding so far is that they're not really so what the, the this this narrative that big tech is creating about itself this kind of libertarian tech utopian narrative that you see tech um, you know per, uh, uh, espouse all the time and that you see their lobbyists espousing in policy debates you, we don't really pick that up um, in the general you know in this in this corpus of uh, of news media so um, so in any event that's I, I'm not sure where exactly that's going but that's uh, that's what I'm working on now. Yeah, sounds fascinating. Thank you very much, uh, Jody. It's uh, morning. In, it's uh, early morning in in San Francisco. Not that early, but early enough for no, us. No, not bad. And yeah, th <laughs> thank you all for um, joining me over the dinner hour from um, from Israel and yeah, yeah Den it. Denmark for 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 me at the, the moment. But uh, I see people from oh. all over the world. <laughs> I never know where David is. <laughs> <laughs> now the pandemic is almost over and I'm starting to travel again. Thank you very okay. much, Paul, and see you next week. Thank you for Kerry. inviting me, David. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jody. Next week, Kerry Coglianisi. See you next week um, with us. Bye-bye.